everybody. Welcome to another episode of Time Out with Tackle What's Next, where we speak to athletes and executives about how sports has made a difference in their lives and changed the course of their lives, plus the lessons they've learned in life outside of the game. I'm your host, Danielle Berman. I am the founder and CEO of Tackle What's Next, where we help athletes create impact outside of the game and find their purpose in life after sports. So thanks for taking a time out with us today. Today we are talking to Dr. Jen Welter. Jen Welter is an established female trailblazer and sports pioneer. She is the founder of Gridiron Girls, which is, and widely, she's widely known for being the first female coach in the NFL, the first female coach in Madden, and the first female running back in men's pro football. She is a world-renowned speaker and now the author of children's a children's book series called Critter Fritter. Jen's historic journey through sports has allowed her to inspire a generation of women leaders and audiences around the world. And now, through her new book series, Critter Fritter, Jen is able to reach children by promoting themes such as social, emotional, and physical wellness. So talk about tackling what's next. I'm going to bring Jen up on screen. I see her in the live, and we're going to get this conversation going. Hello. How's it going? Hello. How are we doing? Good, good. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for taking the time out with good. us. It's a beautiful, beautiful here. Yeah, sure. Great. Well, I want to start off right off the bat with you've got so many different initiatives that you've started now. Tell us right now, just let's start off with the newest one. What Critter Fritter. Tell us about it. What inspired you to write the book and uh, where can we find it? Yeah, so there's actually a series of four books out right now. Um, they were all created um, to deal with kind of the things that kids were going through um, in dealing with COVID-19. Um, the idea started as I was driving out to California, so driving across country, and I was talking to a good friend of mine, Brooke Foley, and it was she was literally telling me about how her son Danny and his friends were going nuts because they couldn't play hockey and I it made me realize like especially for the younger kids there just weren't as many options for them to kind of deal with being stuck inside yeah. right we we go out we play we we do sports and do a lot of that so I kind of started uh freestyling um, a rhyme into my phone and sent it to Brooke. And she was like, Oh, this is really good. And I was like, really? Thanks. And she was like, yeah, Oh, so um, she actually, you know, is a branding person. So she was like, yeah, it's really good. And then we started talking about other things we could do with the kids. We got a little bit away from the kids books and her son, Danny just kept going, mom, what about the book? I like the book. I like the book. And so she goes, so it's the book. And I was like, yeah, we need some serious non-adulting in the world right now because, you know, there was so much going on and it was just all so serious. And I couldn't help with those conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, I had friends of mine who were like globally sourcing PPE yeah. and, you know, on the front lines and doing all this. And I'm like, I got nothing, <laughs> right? Like I, I, got, I got nothing. Um, I'm somebody who tends to think I'm pretty helpful. I'd like to help you, but I can't help in this area. And yet all I could picture was while the adults were busy adulting, the kids like kind of pulling on the sleeve and saying like, you know, what about me? Yeah. And so the first book was written and that was, um, so that's this one, the blue. Um, it's an adventure and movement. Love it. Um, and so, you know, busy sees these kids that are really upset and they're stuck inside and takes them through all animal-based exercises. Um, so I, we have a dynamic warm-up, um, some different, you know, you're gonna inchworm, you're gonna, you know, meet up with the owl who ruffles your feathers and you ruffle together, um, just really to kind of play pretend. I like to say it was giggles and wiggles, um, and then cool <laughs> down at the end. Um, the next one that was written is when a ladybug can't hug. Oh, and cute about how you could connect through 
the heart while staying six feet apart. Um, and it was uh, inspired by my Chihuahua Tyson, who I definitely snuggled with quite a bit. Um, and just really how many people were saying, gosh, I just, I just want to hug. Yeah. Right. And um, for kids, especially to really be able to deal with the fact that it wasn't you, um, you didn't do something wrong and that you could still be close with your friends. So connecting kind of virtually. Mm -hmm. um, then the next one, the third one was wearing a mask says, I love you. Um, because the mask really needed a hero story and wanted to take the complex things that kids were hearing and just make them um, understandable, right? Like make it something mm -hmm. that, you know, if the adults are talking like asymptomatic transition, transmission for example this is a problem it's like the virus hops from bug to bug really quick and bugs can pass it without even feeling sick yeah super easy. you know just to make it something that they could handle and be in charge of and mm -hmm. be a proactive positive part of the solution um that one's the one that's probably gotten the most buzz um you know it we launched on the today show and got really great reviews on the books and then the newest one is actually the resili ants. Oh, um, dude, I love these. They're so an adorable. Absolutely ant filled adventure. Uh, yeah, you know, the ants are actually connect they're the connective tissue in that one. So it's like we have characters like Sargent and Brilliant, and they go to a place called self quarantine where you keep where you go when you need to keep more than six feet in between. Um to just really have these conversations, talk about testing, mm -hmm. um, and then how we could put it all together and, you know, have a reopening guide so that, you know, um, everybody could get back to kind of life. Um, and as you see, Resili Ants, you know, at the end, Ladybug is, is truly our heart led hero. Um, and she says, you know, you can't have resilience without the ants. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, the spelling was wrong. It was <laughs> perfectly right. Um, and so we really do make an effort to, you know, use the words in the right way, teach the kids, um, you know, all of these words that have ants in them. I had no idea until I yeah. wrote it. Um, kind of have a way in which the kids could communicate. Um, and, you know, the the brilliance of the illustration too, which is, you know, Brooke Foley's our creative director and um, she brought in Amanda to, to illustrate them is that kids will actually draw the characters Yeah, um, are meant to be drawn in a way that kids could literally pick up a pen and draw themselves in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows for them to be tools, which book should be, but these are really in, um, intentionally written and drawn so that it doesn't give you all the answers. It gives you great points of reference, but then yeah. hopefully it's a starter. So Jen, how did you decide, you know, you talked about like, you know, Brooke saying this should be a book. This should be a book. How did, how did you do it? You know, I think a lot of our audience is probably thinking, how did she figure out the steps to get there? So, so what kind of process did you have to learn a new process to get this stuff done? Did you use any of those skills that you used in sports to get this done? Yeah. So, well, I, you know, I have a master's in sports psychology and when I was getting it, one of the things that I realized is that a lot of the tools for sports psychology were really um, geared towards adults. Mm. And so I started to study play and drawing therapy as a way to build that gap because I was, or to bridge that gap because I was working with a lot of like high performing yet younger kids. And so mm -hmm. I studied a lot of just the communication methods, always thinking I would probably do something with kids book space, but not necessarily knowing what. Um, and so I had that background, um, you know, Brooke, is a creative director. So she's been on, you know, the layout and design part for, for a while. So we really just kind of like dug in and figured it out. Um, and then even, you know, going through what does self publishing look like? Why would you go that way? 
Um, we talked to some different publishers who, you know, were like, oh, well, we could have these out in a year. And I'm thinking, we don't, we don't need this out in a year. We need this like yesterday. <laughs> um, and we really wanted to be able to help. So mm -hmm. we did a couple of things. Um, a friend of mine, Max, owns Caribou, which is a site where you can video conference and read books together. So oh, yeah. we first put them up on Caribou so that, um, and they had a deal at that time where it was free for everybody because, and they had a sponsor who was, you know, letting you use all these tools for free. So for me, it was like, well, that's, you know, this is a way that we can get it out to a lot of people, help a lot of people. Um, and then we had to figure out how to get them to be physical books too, because, you know, some people just want books. Um, so some were using them digitally, but then we went through, you know, what does that process look like? The layout, learning how to put them up on Amazon. Mm. Um, I, I still don't think I'm great at the, um, the Amazon marketplace and some of those things, but we did figure out how to get them up. And, you know, I think, for all of the athletes out there, it's, it's kind of what we do, right? Like, this is a this is a way of breaking down information, and as a coach, that's that's the goal. Mm -hmm. So, where do we where do we start? Where do we need to get? Um, how can we bridge the gap between them? What does that look like? And you know, whether you're you're talking to young kids about COVID or big kids about the play that they need to make. It's the information um, and the delivery. And so, you know, it's it's really been fun mm. to kind of get, I think, to be um, really honed into, you know, what that voice looks like. Would my would this character say this? Would that character say that? Um, and then doing it in a way that allows people to really kind of fall in love with the stories and the simplicity of them. Yes, I, I love that. And I, I love the connection that you made one with sounds like you've surrounded yourself with a really great team that can help you accomplish all of these different things. And then two, just the lessons you're taking in. It's about using the tactics I'm, I'm working in as a coach working in uh, with those big kids and just breaking it down into a new demographic here. So I love those two synergies. And I, I want to talk a little bit about your coaching and your um, athletic experience too. So can you tell us about your first sports experience? What was the first sport you played? And how did you decide to pursue football and coaching and you know all of that journey that you've you've been down now now yeah so um I mean I grew up in an athletic family we're always you know we've always been active um so it was just really a matter of what activities you were going to do and those that you gravitated towards um I ended up really falling in love with tennis at an early age. That was my sport for a long time. Um, and I think part of that was because it was the one sport where you could see women playing on TV. Mm. Um, you know, and I just, I thought these are, these are the ideal for a woman, right? They're strong and powerful and they're doing it on their terms. And, you know, women like Gabriella Sabatini and Zena Garrison and Martina Navratilova, um, they moved me, right? And and I was, you know, with them as they as they competed and cheered for them and wanted to be like them. Mm -hmm. And so I played tennis for a very long time, ended up switching into team sports. Um too. Um, because wow. football was not a sport you know, that girls actually played, so. Yeah, and so so becoming a part of football, you know, as a woman, you've coached in the NFL, and you're the first female running back in pro football. What was that journey like? What were some of your favorite parts? What were, obviously, I'm sure, some of the challenges that you faced breaking into that field? Well, you know, football for women is, you know, it's this really special place. Um, and I say that because football is still the only sport that doesn't have parity at any level, right? From peewees to the pros. We, we actually refer to football as the final frontier for women in sports. Mm. So 
to me, it was like, if we could play football and do it the right way, couldn't we do anything, mm -hmm. right? It's the place and the space that, um, you know, we, we, could, we could change the dynamics of, of women in society. And, um, you know, all of us were playing the game for the right reasons. You know, you're not, as a woman, you're not playing football to, you know, with dreams of like going to the NFL. That wasn't what right. it was. You know, we were all working by day, playing football by night and playing with the belief that this is a place and a space we were meant to be in and that we could do it the right way. Mm -hmm. And it, I think journeys like that just fortify you and really teach you who you are. Um, football has definitely made me the person that I am. It's given me um, this wonderful football family that I, I lovingly get to say is women and men who I have played with, played against, coached with, coached against. Um, we are every make, model, shape, size, creed, color, sexual orientation, religious background, you name it, we've got it. And our diversity makes us who we are. Mm. It makes us. And so there's this love that I, of football that I have through those experiences, right? And, you know, to have been able to play with the best women in the world, right? To win gold medals, you know, um, to represent the U.S. in America's game. Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, it's mind blowing to think of, you know, what that first really means, right? Like there wasn't a U.S. national team before us. Mm -hmm. There was no, you know, history or legacy of Team USA. We get to be a part of that. We we got to be the ones who, you know, set that standard. Yeah. We got to be the ones that, you know, beat the world 201 to zero over three games, right? And yet we also got to be the ones who came, came back to the USA and nobody even knew we existed, mm -hmm. you know, and to really live that reality of the disparity of what it means to be um, a woman in sports versus, you know, a guy in sports, yeah. particularly in football. Um, and yet it, it teaches you so much, right? I think female athletes, we have had to be multiple in our lives because you know we weren't given that opportunity to have that singular focus mm -hmm. right like for me i got my phd and my masters because i wanted to create a place where i could fit in sport right you know because it it wasn't that women were coaching football right like i i i sometimes think like imagine how great i could have been if that was my whole job. Yeah. Right. If you could have if dedicated was, all your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we had those resources as women, mm -hmm. you know, um, and yet it shouldn't then be surprising that we have uh, fluidity or the ability to do multiple things in our lives because we've always had to. Exactly. Right. Like, I mean, I I lovingly think of the days when I got to just do football. I'm like, wow, I only have a job, right? Yeah, it's a big job. And yeah. it's, it's an exhausting job. But it, it was the only time in my life when I, I only had one job. Yeah. And, you know, I think if you ask any of the the guys who are around me in those situations, they're like, it's just another level. You have such a a joy for it. I'm like, because we're never supposed to be able to be here. Yeah. Right. And I think that appreciation is, is very special. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and in a lot of those situations, everybody told me they were all impossible. Yeah. Right. Um, and yet we overcame them together. Right. Like I, I, I never found it that the guys didn't want to be coached by a woman. I right. think there are a lot, a lot of things that are complicated, right? Like the the politics might be complicated, the media stories might be complicated, but the men, really, if you could make them better, they were like, okay, <laughs> like cool, dope, yeah. and like 
they were actually very proud of being a part of history. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, it gives me a different perspective on the world and what we can be like um, having been in, in so many of those situations. Yeah. And I think that is such a great sentiment for you to really express that one, the dichotomy of we are so good and we come back home and everyone's like, I'm sorry, you play football. Like, isn't that for guys? What are you talking about? And now you see this year, the last, I guess, 2020, you see a, a woman, Sarah Fuller, playing in NCAA football. What was it like for you to see that and see how accepted that was? You know, what was, was that for you, progress in the right direction? Um, you know, I, I, first of all, I think it's, it's great that the response was there. Um, but what I also think is really important is that people realize that there was an openness to her because of all of the women who have been doing work for a very long time. Right. Right. That, that she got support in ways that other women haven't necessarily gotten, you know, um, there's, there have been kickers before her. And I think it's really important to bring them into the conversation. You know, um, you have Julie Harshberger, Patricia Blinkus, you have Becca Longo, mm -hmm. you know, you have Kate Hindi, you have these amazing women who weren't all celebrated right. at all times, right? You have Tony Harris, who um, was the first woman to earn a four-year college scholarship. You know, you have Becca Longo, who was the first female to get a college scholarship as a kicker, mm -hmm. right? these women are really significant in why you got that opportunity and all of the women playing women's tackle football who haven't been invited to inaugurations or, you know, haven't gotten that same reception. Um, I think it's really important that it's taken in context. Yeah. And I hope we always use something like that as an opportunity to shine the light on the women who are in the trenches and, you know, have been fighting this fight for a really long time. Yeah. You know, um, I know when I played in men's pro football, I didn't get that kind of reception right. um, that, you know, that Sarah got, you know, I didn't get invited to the white house for that. Um, I did when I coached in the NFL, but you know, these are these are things that are really important, and when you're in that position, it's it's so important to see how you fit within what the world has going on, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the you know the reception of you in that role was because you know people have now seen women coaching in the NFL, and we've you know we've seen and we want to see more, right? Um. But it's, it's got to be a bigger conversation than just thinking that it's one woman in one, one place and one space. Exactly. You're there because of the very strong shoulders of women who no one may know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? I was going to say, people probably might not even know that she wasn't the first, you know, the first person to do that. Maybe not exactly that situation, but there are many women that have come before her. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and, you know, to me, that's what I would like her to know, mm -hmm. right? That that just means somebody has to say, um, "Hey, Sarah, this is super dope. Have you heard of these people?" Right, right. Like, and make sure that that we're we're giving the full story, right? Because it doesn't take anything away from what she did, mm -hmm. right? Actually, it actually really means that you're not alone. Yeah, I was going to say, if you can use her to amplify the names of those that have come before her and because she has eyeballs to share the stories of these women, that would be amazing. And just the, the family she create for herself. So I think that's really important to, to make a note of. Absolutely. Right. Especially because, you know, she came from outside of football. Mm -hmm. So it would, she probably wouldn't know. Yeah. And so I just hope, like, I know um, I'm doing an event with her coming up and, and that's something that I'm going to, you know, talk to her about is make sure that you, you learn who these women are mm -hmm. because, you know, you're, you're welcome in 
this journey. Yeah. And you're welcome to be a part of changing this game. And you're not alone. Yeah. Right. Because I think it's really hard to feel like you're the only one mm -hmm. or that, you know, your, your part in the journey has maybe, you know, maybe been forgotten. Right. Um, or that, that you came early. Right. Sometimes I tell people, I'm like, I just came too early. <laughs> right. Like, um, because yeah. the reception is different or people are more open to it. But the reason they're more open to it is that somebody had to do these things first. Yeah. And they have to have the tough experiences for, you know, that celebration to occur. Yeah. I love, I love this entire conversation because I think it also ties into just being um, able to talk about athlete activism in general, right? And I think one of the things that we've seen, especially in the last 12 months, is public opinion has shifted entirely, um, not only with women breaking barriers, but just athletes speaking out on anything that's important to them. And I think you're 100% right in, if you're gonna do this, if you're gonna put yourself out there, be mindful and think about the folks that have sacrificed and not gotten the great reception and pay homage to them talk about their journeys, their struggles, and that you're doing this because they have done this work for you. So I love, absolutely love that sentiment. And any athletes listening, keep that in mind. And whatever you're standing up for or whatever barriers you're breaking, look behind you, bring them forward, and also look in front of you and say, thank you. Thank you so much for all the work you've done to get me here. Um, and I thank you for, for just being a mentor and, a, and a, role, a role model for her as she gets into this space. And I wanted to just extend that to your advice to athletes in general. You've obviously made the journey to professional in a sport that, you know, wasn't high paid, didn't have sponsorships, endorsements, all these different things. For you to transition, you know, again, like you said, you were always doing a lot of different things. You didn't have that luxury how how what advice would you give to athletes that maybe think they have that luxury or aren't really sure what they want to do outside of sports like what what worked for you to kind of say okay here's how i'm gonna pursue all of my different interests right necessity one but like what was that motivating factor what can athletes do to start preparing for that maybe they have that excellent perk of focus <laughs> You know, I think it's really important to realize that, like, yes, being great um, requires your time and your investment in your time. But we also have other elements of self. Mm -hmm. And the way that you round out um, an athlete identity in terms of, you know, what happens if there's an injury or something that we can't predict is that you have other pillars of self. Right. And, you know, there are uh, as as singularly focused as we might be, there are still other elements of you that make you you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not all of those are meant to be a career path, but some of them could be. And so make sure that as you develop excellence in your athletic career, they are also investing in the other things that you enjoy. Yeah. Right. If fashion, learn about fashion and surround yourselves um, with people who are in fashion so that you could not only wear it, but be knowledgeable about it, right? If it's, if it's kids, then, you know, take classes. Um, or if you're an illustrator, right? Like, look at Martellus Bennett, right? Like, I love Marty B. I've known him, I don't even know how long, right? Like, I remember he used to say, I was this, I was this little football player in Dallas, right? Like, he knew me before, um, a lot of other people did. And to see him taking off in his illustration work mm -hmm. and his character, you know, that's not something new, but the focus on it is, yeah. right? His creativity and his mind and, and his way of, you know, kind of seeing the world, um, you know, those are, are things that can be developed. So feed those parts of your spirit. If you, you know, and make sure that you're surrounding yourself with experts, right? That will teach you the ways to do it. You, you know, there's this, it's hard with the athletes and, and with so many of us, I, I say it's like, there's this halo of greatness, mm -hmm. right? We are really, really good at something. 
it's like there's this halo of greatness that hangs around you that people just assume because you're really great at this that you'll be really great at all of these other things yeah and it's not that we can't be but just like you you know spend all this time learning investment banking right or something else um and not something else which might have been my sport um you could learn these other things, but you're, you've been so focused, right. right? And yet we often minimize our own talents, right? Like, oh, it's just this. Okay, well, it's just that for you because you're an expert in it. But for me who never learned it, it's like Greek, mm -hmm. right? Again, not because I'm not an intelligent person. Obviously I have a PhD, I'm intelligent. But there are certain parts of the world that I haven't, walked in I haven't learned in um and so a lot of the times what's difficult for athletes is like and I know I've done this I'm like yeah I don't I don't know that or I don't know how to do that can you help me with that or oh wow you're you know you're amazing at that and people will be like oh stop you could do it well but why is that the expectation right like yes you're right I'm I might be able to or I could build my team with other people who are really good at it. Right. So for the athletes, I would say, find those dimensions of self that you are curious about, that you, that interest you. Is it content creation? You know, you have a lot of opportunities um, as an athlete to also be a creator because, you know, what you're doing is in motion. Um, do you think that you might want to transition into talking sports after? Okay. Well, maybe you want to do um, a podcast or something in the off season, you know, don't look at it as like your life in everything else has to start the day that your athleticism ends, yeah. you know, be a curious participant in the world and start to develop those interests so that you have those other interests and aspects of self and can expand on them when you have more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I think you gave a great example at the beginning talking about when you're bringing this book series to life, how you didn't just say, Oh, I'll figure out every aspect of it myself. I'm going to brand it myself because I can do it. I'm a smart person. You said, look, I have this idea. I'm going to take it to my friend in branding. I'm going to take it to my friend who has the audiobook reading site, right? I'm going to bring all these people together so that my genius, the book idea, and the, the goal setting, the pushing it forward can happen. And I think it's just a perfect example of you putting that into play in life, you know, not sports related, right? You're coming in, you're saying, look, I'm going to take this same mindset. I'm going to apply it to this book series. So Thank you for all that advice. Thanks for sticking around a little bit longer than we had planned here. I appreciate your time. Um, Absolutely. And just before you sign off again, can you tell us where can people find Critter Fitter? And again, just kind of a last plug for, for who this book is really for. Yeah, for sure. So um, we are Get Critter Fitter on social. Um, and which mostly is on Instagram. I'm kind of playing around with that, trying to see what that brand looks like. Um, because that's something you learn too, right? Does your, you know, do your other businesses get housed on your social? Do they get a life of your own? You know, not everybody wants to necessarily see me talk about kids books on my <laughs> other one. And, and yet they might be interested. Right. Um, all of these things, which are interesting, but um you know, all of the books are available on Amazon. They're also available on Caribou. If you're on Caribou and you want to read video, read with somebody, you can do that. Um, but you can buy them on Amazon. We are currently looking for partnerships for schools and hospitals um, because we need to get these books into the hands of more kids. Yeah. Um, that is something that I have yet to figure out um, is kind of the, the sales in that market. But right now you can purchase them on demand. You can prime them um on amazon and again the books are um critter fitter with busy bee and adventure and movement when a lady ladybug can't hug wearing a mask says i love you and the resilience um you can also find information on jenwelter.com which will link to the website has all that stuff as well i am welter 47 on instagram jwelter 47 on twitter um, Dr. Jen Welter on Facebook. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn as well as Welter 47, I think. So, awesome. um, 
We'll plug Definitely. this all in. We'll, we'll make sure everybody has the links and knows where to go to. And Jen, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for taking a time out with us to talk about your journey. And I, again, really love your sentiment about looking behind you and thanking those folks that have really broken those barriers. The advice you've given to all the athletes watching now and that will watch this recorded later. Um, and, and thank you for taking some time with us tonight. It's a pleasure to speak with you and really best of luck with the book. We'll definitely promote it around. And again, like she said, if anybody's looking for some great books for their kids right now, they know any schools, hospitals, places where kids might really enjoy these books. Please reach out to her, reach out to us. We'll connect you with her. Um, we'll make sure you guys get linked up. So Jen, thanks for taking a time out with us. And everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your night. Yes. Thanks, Jen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.